Welcome to the uh, beta colloquium of November. After the more mathematical theme which we had in October, we this time have a subject which is uh, at the interface of astrophysics, cosmology, and particle physics. Uh, much in the sense of Hans Bethe, who has actually been a pioneer in that field. So the subject today is uh, the question of dark matter, which has been discussed a lot in the last decades. And as I see, it seems to raise some interest among the people. Uh, we are happy that uh, for this occasion, we could convince two renowned scientists to talk about the subject, share their view the subject. Uh, this is Pavel Krupa uh, from the Argelander Institute of Astronomy here in Bonn, and Simon White from the Max Planck Institute in Garching. We thought that at the eve of the LHC, while there are ongoing direct dark matter searches, and while there are a lot of astrophysical and cosmolo cosmological observations, we might actually look at this question of dark matter and see what is the status. And so we got two uh, speakers which uh, do not share the same view. They have opposing view, which, of course, is good for a debate. <laughs> so, uh, well, since uh, we have a tight schedule, I will not uh, talk too much. And since we started a bit earlier, we might even then start in time uh, with the... Uh, after having uh, extended the academic quarter. So I won't say too much about the, the two people. Everybody essentially in this one knows them. Nowadays, you can see it on the web, just a few short things. They seem to share one thing which I did not know before. They both got their PhD in Cambridge, England. Uh, and uh, Pavel Krupa, uh, he, he is actually from Australia. He got his degree in England. Then he went to Heidelberg, Kiel. And since uh, 2004, he is professor in the Argelander Institute here, auf dem Hügel, as we say. Simon Waite, after got his PhD, has been at various places, including Toronto, Berkeley, Santa Barbara, Arizona, Durham. And he is now in Munich at the Max Planck Institute and the LMU since 1994, I guess. So that's enough about the people, they will have enough time to tell uh, what their idea is about dark matter. Uh, the schedule will be the following. First, Simon White will talk for 25 minutes. And then there will be a possibility to ask a few questions of clarification. Not yet a debate, just <coughs> urgent question which uh, you cannot keep back, although you should try to do so. After that. Uh, Pavel Krupa will talk for 25 minutes as well. Same rule that there are some questions. After that, I guess each of the two speakers should have five minutes again to summarize their main points and also to react on the talk of the previous or the previous talk. And then uh, it will be followed by a debate among the two of them. And if we still have time, there might also be questions from the audience. Good, so that's all I want to say. Uh, so we start with uh, Simon White, please. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. So today we're supposed to discuss uh, the interpretation or the existence of a series of phenomena in astrophysics, which have come to be known as the dark matter issue or dark matter problem. We're supposed to debate this. So I think I'd better start with a definition of dark matter, which I hope at least Pavel can agree to this is just as a definition. So dark matter is supposed to be, I should probably insert here, is supposed to be the dominant material constituent by mass of all objects significantly larger than individual galaxies. But it's so far only been inferred from its gravitational effects. So I hope we could agree on that with what we're talking about. So the fact that it's only been seen from its gravitational effects then leads to a fundamental question. Does it exist as a kind of matter or is our, our theory of gravity incorrect? And so the problem is that our 
the way we've used gravitational forces to infer the amount of matter is incorrect because we've used the correct, incorrect theory of gravity. Now, if it does exist, which is the majority view at the moment, but this is only a view, because as I say, it's only been seen gravitationally. If it does exist, then the next question, of course, would be what would it be made of? And one of the reasons many people feel uncomfortable with dark matter is that it cannot be made of any of the kinds of matter that we already know about and have shown by other means. And so the dominant hypothesis is that it's some new kind of elementary particle which is different from any of the particles that have been seen on Earth. So this is basically the overall issue. So dark matter isn't a new issue in particle physics. It's been around for a long time. Maybe the first kind of dark matter was the inference was the neutron, because this was inferred by um, Bart Seaman and Ivenko to be needed in atomic nuclei in 1930. They needed a particle which had no electromagnetic interactions, but still had strong interactions. And of course, its existence was verified by a number of experiments by Chadwick within two years. Now, the next kind of dark matter was the neutrino, which was actually, uh, the need was identified by Pauli in the same year, and this was from weak interactions, and there, there was a need for a particle which didn't interact either by electromagnetically, so with light, or through strong interactions, but through weak interactions. And that was a harder problem. It took until 1956 before the existence of the neutrino was independently verified by other means using the huge flux of neutrinos that you get from atomic reactors. Now, dark matter, the need, was identified by Zwicky at about the same time. And here, it was already in a, par a particle which apparently did not emit light, and since then we've discovered it doesn't, it would, need not, could, would not, could not interact into, uh, electromagnetically or, or with strong interactions, but may not even interact with weak interactions, because it's only inferred through gravity. So there's a kind of hierarchy here. So it took 50 years, actually, until the early 1980s, before all the known particles could be excluded as a possible source for dark matter. The last one were the known neutrinos. The known neutrinos could be ruled out about 1980 because they produced the wrong kind of structure. So there, we still haven't verified the existence of any other means. So we don't know when this is going to happen, if it happens, but it's clearly after 2010. Now, inferring the existence of objects from their gravity is not new. Neptune was predicted by Leverrier and Adams in 1846 from the perturbations in, in the uh, orbit of Uranus, and it was verified the same year by Gallant. Leverrier was, Leverrier was very key, happy with this, so he then moved on to, to Mercury and predicted the an existence of a planet called Vulcan, which, which was uh, supposed to be, explain the deviations of Mercury's orbit from Newtonian theory. He was wrong. This was explained by Einstein in 1915 by changing the theory of gravity. Okay, so this is an example of how the other side could be the case. Now, there are, are uh, other examples well-known where objects are inferred by their gravity. So I listed two here. All the extrasolar planets, this is one of the great success stories of the last year, we now know about 500 planets around stars other than our own. But 400 of those, their existence is only inferred by the gravitational perturbations on the parent stars. But we don't think that's a new theory of gravity. The other case is massive black holes at the centers of, the Mil of, of galaxies, in particular at the center of the Milky Way. That's detected only through the motion of the surrounding stars. And so here's the obligatory um, video from Munich showing the motions, observed motions of stars near the center of our Milky Way. So this image is only 10 light days across. And what you see here are the actual measured motions, and you can see that the stars appear to be orbiting around something at the center, which has been, in the images, being made as a white blob here, but it's not seen at all in the real world. And assuming these are Kepler orbits, you infer that there's an object at the center with a mass of 4 million solar masses. So there are plenty of cases where gravity has been used to infer objects, and some where we don't question this, even though in this last case it involves a black hole with a, a 4 million solar masses. So the need for, black, uh, for dark matter was inferred first by this fellow, Fritz Zwicky. He's, this was a picture in the 1970s. So he, he inferred it by measuring the, uh, the, the velocities of a small number of galaxies in this particular cluster of galaxies, the Coma Cluster, which is the nearest very rich cluster. 
what he realized, the relative velocities of these galaxies, there are about 1,000 galaxies in a small region of space, the motions of the galaxies through this region were so large that if they're gravitationally induced, then it needs much more material than he could see in the stars. And so he inferred then that there must be a lot of stuff in the cluster which is not visible. That result was correct. I mean, it hasn't changed with much more data. But no one knew how to interpret it, so it's basically sat there for 40 years. An interest in the problem came up again then in the 1970s when people started looking at objects like this one. This is a galaxy quite close to our own, the Triangulum Nebula. It's a galaxy which is an almost pure disk galaxy. So everything you see here, the stars and the gas, are essentially rotating in a disk about the center. So it's kind of like a mini solar system but without a sun at the middle, at least nothing you can see. So if you measure the motions of the material about the center, you can plot the velocity of which the material moves about the center as a function of distance, and you get a curve like the yellow dots here. That's called the rotation curve. And what you see is the, number, the, the curve rises from the center, and then instead of flattening off or even going down, like it does in the solar system because of Kepler's laws, it actually, in this case, keeps on going, rising. So if you then use Newton's laws to infer the amount of material here, you infer the further out you go, the more mass you need. Whereas the light, as you can see, stops. And so this led uh, Vera Rubin, shown here in the 1960s, uh, to, who did this on a number of, of galaxies, to, to stress that apparently there was much more mass surrounding galaxies than you could see in their stars from these rotation curves. So this, I think, is today the most direct evidence of the existence of dark matter. So this is actually not the universe today. This is an image of the universe when it was only 400,000 years old. This is the map of the microwave background radiation taken by the WMAP satellite. So what you're seeing here is a direct image of the universe when it was only 400,000 years old. And at that time, it was nearly uniform. You don't see it here, but the, the contrast between the hottest and coldest points on this map at plus or minus 200 microkelvin. So that means the, the, the peak to valley variation is only 10 to the minus 4 of the average value. So it's extremely nearly uniform. And what you're seeing here is small fluctuations in the temperature and also the density and pressure in a nearly uniform mixture of gas and uh, photons. So those are sound waves. And we understand the physics of sound waves. They're linear. These are linear sound waves propagating in a non-relativistic, well, sorry, in a, in a gas, in a, in a plasma of non-relativistic matter plus photons. So we, since we can understand the uh, physics of sound waves, we can learn about three things from this map. We can learn about the geometry of the universe, its content, and the process which caused the fluctuations. So for today's debate, the second is the important one. We learn about what is present at that time. The way you characterize this is by looking at the power spectrum. So this is the amplitude as a function of wavelength of the fluctuations in this gas, and this is the results from uh, ten year, uh, sorry, seven year uh, data from WMAP. So this is the wavelength, these are the long waves, these are short waves on the sky, this is the amplitude, these are the data points, and you can see there's a very clear, ah, okay, there's a very clear um, pattern here. These are on the large scales of the well-defined amplitude. There's a rise to a, a peak here at about one degree, a trough, a second peak here, this wavelength, a third peak, then quite a large drop. Now these are small, these are data from ground-based experiments here, so, but you can see a, another peak here, and here, not really, from the noise. But certainly one, two, three, very well measured. So this then tells us about the material content, what is driving these sound waves. Now this is actually very sensitive to the presence of some